It had been a bad week for Evan Spiegel. His business idea called Future Freshman had failed, and his girlfriend of two years had just broke up with him. But then suddenly his friend Reggie burst into his room with an idea, a way of sending photos that disappear. Evan was immediately excited and said he thought it was a million dollar idea. He was wrong. It was a multi-billion dollar idea. The driving force behind it was exactly what you might expect. The guys wanted a way to send nudes without having a permanent copy saved. They also figured girls would be more likely to send them photos if the pictures disappeared afterwards. However, as Evan thought about the idea more, he realized the potential went far beyond that. Evan had always disliked that on the internet everything felt permanent. Every silly message you wrote, every drunken picture, all of it was out there for good and could come back to haunt you. But a disappearing photo app would allow people to share things more freely without any worry. So Evan and Reggie were eager to start this photo sharing app together and agreed to split everything 50-50. But then they realized neither of them could code well enough to actually build the app, so they began trying to find someone else to work with. Several people turned them down, either because they were too busy or just didn't get the point of the app. But eventually, Evan managed to convince a friend of his called Bobby to help them, and he put in long days and nights of coding to help build a working prototype, which they originally named Pickaboo. They sent it to some friends who used the app a surprisingly high amount, proving the app had potential. Soon afterwards, Stanford had an event where students could pitch their business ideas to investors, and so Evan presented their new app. However, none of the investors were remotely interested. An app where the photos don't save? If anything, it felt like a step backwards, and certainly not something they wanted to invest money into. Little did the investors know, they just missed an opportunity to make billions of dollars. Meanwhile, the Stanford teaching assistant who'd organized the event was horrified, and pulled Evan aside to ask him, have you created a sexting app? And to make things worse, Evan then received a cease and desist letter from a phone book company who already had the name Pickaboo, so they had to come up with a new name. They decided on Snapchat, a combination of snapping a photo and chatting with friends. But it's fair to say it had been a rough start for the company. The only real users they had were their friends, and nobody wanted to invest. At that moment, it was almost impossible to imagine that in less than two years, Facebook would try to buy their app for three billion dollars. Despite the poor initial reception, Evan, Reggie and Bobby plowed on. Bobby continued long hours of coding to improve the app, while Evan worked on the vision and design. He analyzed the most popular apps on the App Store and noticed none had yellow logos. So to stand out, Snapchat would have a very bright yellow background. However, whilst Evan and Bobby were working hard on Snapchat, Reggie didn't really seem to have much he was contributing. He'd only just turned 21 and seemed much more interested in partying than building a business. This quickly began to cause some resentment and tension between the three co-founders. Reggie later overheard Evan and Bobby talking about kicking him out of the company, which led to an explosive argument. Whilst it's true that Reggie was doing less work, it's also true that he'd come up with the initial idea in the first place. After several furious debates about who deserved what, Evan and Bobby changed the passwords and locked Reggie out. This would later lead to lawyers getting involved in an ugly legal battle between the three former friends. But we'll get to that. For now, Snapchat was down to two co-founders, and Evan was doing everything he could to try and get new users, ranging from emailing bloggers to handing out flyers in shopping malls. Anything to get the word out about their app. But most people just didn't seem to get the appeal. And then, quite suddenly, everything changed. Snapchat suddenly got a huge uptick in users from one specific group, teenagers. And the number of users started growing rapidly every month. What was 2,000 daily active users in December became 20,000 daily active users in January. Snapchat was essentially going viral amongst a younger user base who shared it with their friends, who shared it with their friends, and so on. A huge factor in this was that Snapchat was in many ways the opposite of other popular social media. With sites like Facebook, people's parents and even grandparents had started joining, whereas Snapchat felt more like a small private club for friends. And even more importantly, with Facebook and Instagram, teenagers felt more pressured to post the most glamorous filtered versions of their life. Whereas because photos on Snapchat disappeared, people could send casual, authentic images. They could send quick little snapshots of their life throughout the day, rather than trying to create a perfect image. And this meant people use Snapchat much more often. Plus, since the platform didn't have likes or retweets or any other metrics, it felt much more fun. The rapid growth in users helped Snapchat secure funding from investors, meaning Evan could begin hiring a bigger team to help grow the business. 
It was starting to seem Snapchat could be a legitimate communication tool. Of course, not everyone saw it that way. When the media wrote about Snapchat, many still saw it as a gimmick or a sexting app, no matter how much Evan tried to change the narrative. The sexting component was even more troubling given how young Snapchat's users were. And while Snapchat technically didn't allow anyone under the age of 13, they didn't actually have any way of enforcing that policy. But the truth is, Snapchat genuinely did have a lot of use cases. Teenagers essentially started using Snapchat instead of text messaging. Rather than send someone just a message, they could send a photo of them in that moment with a short caption. It felt more personal. However, now that Snapchat was starting to get popular, Reggie returned, and he filed a lawsuit against Evan and Bobby, claiming he'd been unfairly kicked out. The whole process was brutal and dragged on for months, which took a toll on all three founders. But eventually, a settlement would be reached for Reggie to get a lump sum payment in exchange to never speak about Snapchat again. Meanwhile, Snapchat users were continuing to increase rapidly, and by October 2012, 20 million photos were sent each day on the app. And when Snapchat introduced video messages a few months later, things only skyrocketed further. But it wasn't just teenagers who were paying attention to Snapchat. There was one man in particular who'd been watching very closely and was ready to make his move. One day, Mark Zuckerberg emailed Evan, inviting him to the Facebook headquarters, saying he loved what Snapchat was doing. The two arranged a meeting, where Mark essentially asked to buy the company. He said Evan and Bobby could stay in charge, but be backed by Facebook's resources. But Evan declined, saying they didn't want to sell. At that moment, Mark Zuckerberg showed Evan a new app Facebook had created that they were about to release, called Poke, which was a blatant copy of Snapchat. The features, the format, the layout, it was all exactly the same. The implication was simple. You either join us, or we crush you with our own version of Snapchat. Facebook, of course, had far more money and users, so it could quite literally be the end of Snapchat. Evan left the meeting and ordered a copy of the same book for every Snapchat employee, The Art of War. If Zuckerberg wanted a battle, Evan wasn't gonna go down without a fight. When Poke launched, Mark sent Evan one more email, just one sentence long. I hope you enjoy Poke. Facebook's new clone app immediately shot to the top of the App Store, since they pushed a notification to all of their billion users. The Snapchat team were understandably panicked, and the thought must have crossed Evan's mind that he should have just sold out when he had the chance. But Poke very quickly fell back down the rankings, and basically faded into obscurity. Poke did not catch on at all, and there's a couple of reasons for this. Firstly, because it was a clone, it quite literally offered nothing different to Snapchat, so there was no incentive for users who liked Snapchat to switch. Secondly, a lot of people liked Snapchat specifically because it was separate and closed off from their other social media. They didn't want something that was connected to their Facebook account. So, Poke completely failed to take off, and within a couple of years, Facebook would terminate it completely. Not that anyone really noticed. And it got even worse for Zuckerberg. The whole incident gave Snapchat more publicity and proved to investors that Snapchat couldn't just be easily replicated. It also proved there was clearly big potential with this disappearing photo concept if even Facebook was trying to do it. Evan would later call Poke the greatest Christmas present we ever had. So in just one year, Snapchat had gone from an obscure unknown app to now having over a million daily active users sending over 100 million photos each day. Snap me had become a verb in the same way that people said Google it. Snapchat had taken on Facebook and won, or so it seemed. But Zuckerberg wasn't gonna give up that easily. Before we get to the next chapter, I wanna tell you about our video sponsor, public.com, an investing platform that helps people be better investors. You can buy stocks, funds, and crypto with no commission fees on standard equity trades. What I really love about public is their community feature that allows people to share ideas and learn together and so you can see what others are investing in and follow your friends or favorite creators. Not just that, but Public also offers watch and learn videos, regular town hall Q&As with executives of publicly traded companies, and a theme feature that allows you to find stocks and categories that interest you, like sports, green power, or the metaverse. So even if you're an experienced investor or just getting started with investing, Public is the perfect choice. Join me in the community on Public by going to public.com slash magnatesmedia to receive a free stock worth between $3 and $300 when you join and make a deposit. After you've done that, let's get back to the story. 
Evan had studied journalism and was obsessed with the idea of users being able to not just share an individual photo or video, but create a narrative of their experiences. And thus, in 2013, Snapchat launched a new feature called Stories, which became extremely popular. Up until now, Snapchat had primarily been focused on one-to-one -one messaging and communication, but now it was giving users a way to broadcast to all their friends what they were doing. But because stories disappeared after 24 hours, if you weren't on Snapchat each day, you'd feel you missed out. As Snapchat rolled out several other popular new features, and young users continued to use Snapchat far more than Facebook or Instagram, Mark Zuckerberg decided to make one final offer to Evan. But this time, he was going big. Three billion dollars. The offer to buy Snapchat came in late 2013. And remember, Snapchat only started in 2011. And what's even crazier is that Snapchat had virtually no revenue at this point. Yet, there was three billion dollars on the table if they sold Snapchat to Facebook. And because Evan and Bobby owned roughly 25% of Snapchat each, if they accepted Mark's acquisition offer, they'd both instantly have a personal net worth of hundreds of millions of dollars. So even though neither of them wanted to sell the company, this offer was too huge not to consider. And they reportedly went back and forth multiple times about whether to accept. Evan and Bobby were both still in their early 20s, and this money would set them up for life. And yet, to the surprise of many people, Evan and Bobby turned down Mark Zuckerberg's offer once again. They were gonna take a gamble and keep running Snapchat themselves. Evan knew this decision meant Facebook were gonna fight back, and so they had to keep innovating. Snapchat began experimenting with a variety of new features, such as camera lenses that could change someone's appearance, public stories from specific events or locations, content from brands and networks, and Snapchat even dabbled with producing their own original content. Snapchat also set up a new division called Snap Lab to work on things like speech recognition, wearable technology, and augmented reality. Evan believes Snapchat needed to think about what people want next, and not rely on data or focus groups, because that won't lead to big leaps in innovation. In the alleged words of Henry Ford, if I'd asked people what they wanted, they would have said a faster horse. Evan was operating on a similar principle of trying to think what users didn't even know they wanted yet, which meant a lot of decisions were based on his own gut instincts rather than market research. Test quickly and cut it if it doesn't work. Evan wanted Snapchat to become one of the most important technology companies in the world. Unfortunately, his plans to be taken seriously were about to come crashing down. With Snapchat now in the media spotlight, they soon began to face a lot more criticism. Because the photos and messages disappear, Snapchat has been repeatedly linked to crimes, with claims like Snapchat being used by drug dealers to target kids. Another article claimed Snapchat has become a haven for child predators. Then, in August 2013, a security research group reverse-engineered part of Snapchat's app and found security flaws that allowed hackers to access usernames and phone numbers. They actually told Snapchat, but they didn't respond and didn't seem to take the issue seriously. A few months later, a hacker group exploited this and released a database online with the personal details of 4.6 million Snapchat users. Even still, Evan tried to downplay it and never really apologized. Many in the media were furious about his recklessness towards users' data. It also didn't help that Snapchat launched a new feature called Snap Map, allowing you to see the exact location of your friends on a map. Whilst of course you could turn off this tracking feature, remember many of Snapchat's users were very young and perhaps didn't quite realize the potential risks of broadcasting your exact GPS coordinates 24-7. Snapchat also had to settle charges with the FTC over concerns about privacy, when it was found that Snapchat collected a lot more data than it said it did. Additionally, the FTC discovered that snaps did not disappear like they were supposed to and could easily be saved by using third-party apps. And then, somewhat ironically, Evan himself was the victim of a privacy breach when old emails he'd sent whilst at college got leaked to the public. Most of these emails had been sent whilst Evan was drunk and in a fraternity, so they were controversial to say the least. The emails portrayed Evan in the worst possible light, an obnoxious, misogynistic, homophobic frat bro. Evan released a statement saying that he was mortified and that his words were inexcusable, but he was no longer that person. Ironically, Evan must have been wishing he'd created Snapchat a little earlier, as then those messages would have disappeared without a trace. But many in the media called for Evan to be fired immediately. They claimed after all these controversies, it would be impossible for big corporations to do serious deals with Snapchat with Evan as the CEO. Which brings us to the biggest problem of all that Evan was facing. Snapchat was making almost no money. It sounds absurd to say, but even though Facebook had offered to buy Snapchat for around $3 billion, Snapchat still essentially had zero revenue and no proven business model. 
They'd been funding all their expansion with the money they'd received from investors. Snapchat's perceived value came from the fact it had over 100 million active users, which surely could be monetized at a later point. Snapchat just hadn't figured out exactly how yet. To be fair, monetization hadn't been the priority. The focus had been growing as quickly as possible, and filling the platforms with ads could have hurt that. But by 2014, Snapchat was spending over $100 million a year, and Evan was keen to prove that Snapchat had a sustainable business model. So they began testing ways to make money, like letting users pay 99 cents to replay a Snapchat message from a friend. They also tested out a feature called Snapcash, where friends could send money to each other in the app. But the big money was always going to come from advertising. The only problem is Snapchat's ad platform was extremely basic and expensive compared with Google or Facebook ads. Plus, Snapchat had nowhere near the same kind of in-depth data about its users, so they couldn't offer advertisers the same level of targeted advertising or analytics. To make things worse, Evan personally rejected some ad campaigns that he didn't like or that he thought users wouldn't like. He wanted ads to feel more like content, which meant advertisers had to create new original ads exclusively for Snapchat. But despite all of those drawbacks, Snapchat did have one major advantage. It was one of the best ways for advertisers to reach a younger demographic. A demographic they couldn't easily reach anymore with TV or Facebook. Kids and teenagers had their attention on Snapchat, which meant advertisers were willing to throw money at Snapchat ads to try and reach them. And as Snapchat expanded their advertising services further, offering special campaigns like branded filters and lenses, the ad revenue started rolling in. Meanwhile, Facebook continued to try and imitate Snapchat to try and win back younger users for themselves. Since their Snapchat clone called Poke had failed, they tried a new app called Slingshot, which was similar but had a twist where you had to send a picture before you could open the picture you'd received. But it felt forced and unnatural and never caught on. But as well as making new apps, Facebook tried integrating Snapchat features into their existing apps, like adding face filters into their camera just like Snapchat, and adding the stories feature on Facebook, Messenger, WhatsApp, and Instagram. And with that last one, they struck gold. Instagram stories really caught on. By the middle of 2017, it was getting 250 million daily active users, far higher than the 166 million daily active users on Snapchat stories. Even though the feature was essentially a clone from Snapchat, Instagram simply had more users, and thus Instagram was used more. At long last, Facebook had succeeded at copying Snapchat. Not long after, Kylie Jenner infamously tweeted, Does anyone else not open Snapchat anymore, or is it just me? This led to Snapchat stock losing $1.3 billion of value. Some wondered if this was the beginning of the end for Snapchat. And yet, if you look at what Snapchat are actually working on right now, this could in fact just be the beginning. In 2016, Evan renamed the company to Snap Incorporated and began plans to expand the business beyond Snapchat. Their extremely simplistic website states that Snap is a camera company, and they believe that reinventing the camera represents the greatest opportunity to improve the way people live and communicate. Snap then announced their first move into hardware with the launch of Snapchat Spectacles, a pair of sunglasses that with the tap of a button will record a video which is wirelessly sent to your Snapchat account. Evan tested them out himself on a hike and commented, when I got the footage back and watched it, I could see my own memory through my own eyes. It was unbelievable. That's because the glasses record video in a 115 degree circular format, mimicking how the human eyes see things. Admittedly, it may sound like a dystopian Black Mirror episode, and Evan was quick to downplay comparisons to Google Glass by saying there'd be a light on the front so people knew if a user was recording anything, and Spectacles was simply a fun toy. But the truth is, Spectacles could be so much more than a toy because of Snapchat's heavy investment into augmented reality. The world got a first taste of AR with Pokemon Go, but once the novelty wore off, the hype seemed to fade away. But Snap has been leading the way with AR ever since, with its camera lenses that can change the world around you. And this goes far beyond dog ears and vomiting rainbows. Snap are already working with brands to let people see what their clothing would look like if they were wearing it. But even more interestingly, check out this promotional video. Now, Snapchatters can join a persistent shared AR world built right on top of the physical one. You and your friends can step into these worlds together, collaborating creatively and experiencing a whole new dimension of AR. Now, that may look kinda cool, but you could just say it's still a bit gimmicky. However, that's where spectacles could come in. Instead of seeing augmented reality through a phone screen, imagine seeing it through AR glasses that you wear all day. 
it would quite literally be a whole new way to see the world. It's a bit like that scene in Free Guy, where he puts the glasses on, and suddenly there's this whole new layer on top of the world. A layer where anything can be added or redesigned. Truly unlimited creative possibilities. In fact, because of everything Snap's doing with AR, along with its acquisition of Bitmoji, which lets users create a virtual version of themselves, some believe Snap could also play a big role in the metaverse. Once again, putting them in direct competition with Facebook. Or, as they're now called, Meta. However, we'll cover the metaverse in a future video. For now, it's unclear exactly what Snap's endgame is. And because its demographic skews so young, many don't even realise that Snap has been quietly innovating, secretly making acquisitions, and investing heavily in areas like machine learning and artificial intelligence. It's often still referred to as just a messaging app for kids. But what started out as an app for sexting could soon be at the forefront of many new exciting technologies and changing how we experience reality. Or, on the flip side, it's also entirely possible that these new experiments fail completely and it's Zuckerberg who has the last laugh. All we know for sure is that the story of Snapchat still has plenty more twists to come. However, while Snapchat has been repeatedly copied, lately Snapchat have been doing some copying of its own. Like when they launched a feature called Spotlight, which is essentially a TikTok clone. But that didn't stop kids illegally making millions of dollars from it. To find out more, just click here to watch the next video. I'll see you there. Cheers.